I'm Margie Reeve, and I work with the students on the uh, lecture <coughs> planning each term. And I just want to tell you about next week's lecture, which is Wednesday at 7.30, as all the lectures are this term. Next week, Ayara Lee, who is a filmmaker from New York, is going to talk about her work. She's made two documentary films you might have heard of. One is called Synthetic Pleasures, and the other is called Modulations. And um, in both of them, she is really exploring the influence of technology on present and future lifestyles. Her movie called Modulations is about techno rave, and she's done these documentary films along with packaging soundtracks. She's made over 18 CDs. Uh, there's a whole fashion line and books. So she has produced these documentaries and a whole series of, of products. Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting lecture. Next Tuesday at 6, there's a lecture that many of you may not know about. Um, it, there's an architect named Brett Steele who's coming from London, from the Architectural Association's Design Research Lab. He is with his students at the Architectural Association doing um, a lot of large-scale urban projects, thinking about how London and other world cities have been transformed in the last few years and trying to imagine new synthetic forms of urbanism. So that's Tuesday at 6 o'clock in the large lecture room, which is upstairs. Uh, this week, Mark and Peter Anderson are going to present their work. Um, I met Mark and Peter in Cambridge, uh, and they then found their way back to the West Coast, to Seattle, where they have developed what I would characterize as a an Im impressively multivalent practice. Um, to introduce them, Yuval Yasky, who is one of the three editors of Off-Ramp Number 7, forthcoming in spring, um, will speak a bit about their work. Um, the Andersons' work is featured in this journal, and this issue of Off-Ramp explores the boundaries, borders, and edges of contemporary architecture practice. Um, I think you'll see tonight a bit of what the editors of Off-Ramp had in mind when they thought about how to expand the practice of architecture. Yuval? Um, well, Margie spurred most of what I wanted to say, she already said, so I started the middle, basically. Uh, the Andersons have been in the construction business ever since, I think, high school days. Um, both of them went to the Harvard GSD. Um, since then, since graduating, they have been uh, running a very successful design-built practice in Seattle uh, through two companies there. They have the Anderson Anderson Architecture and Bay Pacific Construction. Over the years, they, their projects um, range from very high-end custom houses, um, some of, their, of them award-winning projects, and on the other hand, the very experimental, prefabricated, affordable housing prototypes for the American and the Japanese markets. On the front part of their um, practice, they regularly collaborate with artists and uh, professionals from other uh, disciplines on creating experimental interdisciplinary projects through another uh, company, Jet Construction. Um, in addition to all that, I don't know how they have time for that, they are both educators in Seattle and Hawaii. So let's welcome Peter and Mark Anderson. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm going to speak first, and Mark will follow in a moment here. Thank you for having us here. We really appreciate the chance to, to be here. We really appreciated working with Yuval and the rest of the off-ramp staff over the last year or so on the, the issue that's coming out. It's been a fun process for us. The uh, talk tonight, I think, grows a lot out of what we were asked to do for off-ramp. and. Um, 
we just wanted to show some of the projects that we've done and it's kind of comprehensive in the sense that we wanted to talk about um, kind of the, the, the range of things that are happening. We have the first slides on. So we wanted to talk about the, the range of things that we've done, um, partly to explain the, what Yuval was talking about, the, uh, the borders, I guess, of, of architecture. We've never worried too much about trying to define what we mean by architecture. We've just tried to, to do different things. But the, uh, the title of our article um, in off-ramp and the title of this talk, I guess, is Playing in Traffic. And that is, uh, I guess, more or less our approach to, to doing things. Some people feel like uh, they need a really grand plan for their, their lives and where they're going with their careers. And I'd say we have a, a kind of a, a general plan, but playing in traffic kind of sums up in a lot of ways our, um, our approach to things. We feel like if you, I think we explained a little bit in the article, if you get out in traffic, uh, sometimes you have to, to dodge things that are headed your way that you want to get out of the way of. Sometimes you jump onto something that you can grab onto that's going in the right direction or a direction that you think you want to go. And sometimes you get scooped up by something and thrown a different direction that you didn't know you were going to go that way but um, aren't too unhappy with the direction you end up in. So it seems like there's so many things to, uh, to learn about that there's no way you can know when you start out that making a grand plan and a really uh, focused career plan doesn't always allow for all the opportunities and possibilities that come out along the way. We started our, um, our construction company, Bay Pacific Construction, 15 years ago. Right now, it's uh, this is our 15 year anniversary. Started that uh, before we were licensed as architects and while we were still in graduate school. We started um, working on construction when we were in high school. Um, and Early projects were not glamorous at all, doing things like ripping out uh, rotten decks. Uh, it's a very lucrative business, by the way. Anyone who wants to uh, make money, especially in the Northwest, maybe not as much here, although I've seen a lot of rotten buildings in the last couple of days when I've been here. But uh, ripping apart rotten things is a great education and uh, also a good business opportunity. And uh, makes you really think about how to build things when you start out doing very, uh, very simple things, tearing apart something that has problems and trying to rebuild it in ways that it, the next thing that you build doesn't have problems. But uh, it's a great way to get started. We really appreciate it. We had some early opportunities to do small projects, but where the clients really cared about how it ended up. And I think that shaped a lot of uh, our more recent work that, that we've done. So we w had an opportunity to work in a number of different places, mostly in Washington, but always trying to travel as much as we could, working in Europe a little bit, and um, early design work on the hood of a pickup truck there. Uh, that's, we still do that somewhat. Um, a particularly nasty uh, sliding down the hill, falling apart house, which was probably the best, best education we had to start with. But I think one of the, the themes that we wanted to work through all the way along, had a very uh, kind of playful approach to architecture, always wanting to deal with it in a very real way, you know, solving real problems and uh, working with real materials and experimenting and learning from doing. That's why we've always worked back and forth between building and um, the design and the, the building side and never thought of them as separate. The only reason we have two separate company names is there's a lot of advantages of dealing with clients and banks and all the realities of the real world of construction and architecture. And sometimes it's really nice to pretend you're the contractor and not the architect on the site. And sometimes you want to pretend you're the architect and don't know who the contractor is. So. <laughs> the, um, just quickly ran through some of the earlier projects leading up to the, the more uh, complex custom home projects. I think we wouldn't have gotten any chance to do um, larger projects or more complex projects if we hadn't been through the, the kind of early ranks of tearing apart rotten decks. So um, everything we learned there goes in on into the later projects. We're going to organize the, the talk tonight on these three, three themes of earthwork, framing, and plumbing, which we see as the, um, 
the, the three themes of, uh, of our work. Um, we see it all as very interrelated, the way that um, our projects come out of earthwork, which represents to us very much more um, Actually, you don't have to do that yet. You can put them back to the middle. <laughs> um, Mark, we're going we're gonna to trade off and do different sections. Mark's going to talk about the earthwork section. I'll let him explain that to you. But the, the, some, some people see our work as being um, working in, in different directions. But we feel it's, they're all working from the same set of principles and ideas. And it makes a lot of sense to us. And we hope it makes sense to you after uh, we go through these three sections and explain how they, they come together. So I'll turn it over to Mark here now. And the slides do go back together. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Mark Anderson. And actually, I, I gave some erroneous directions to our projectionist earlier. So. Uh, these do stay together. The, the, the show itself that, that we're giving here is kind of an experiment in uh, playing with some of the, the tools that people have to give lectures with. So there, there, there may be uh, a few glitches here and there, but uh, just we'll, we'll go along with whatever comes up. So as Peter said, we're looking at uh, the idea of dividing our work into three um, into three sections, the, the first one being earthwork, and we, we think of that both in a fairly literal sense, thinking of uh, the way that you cut into the earth and, and start to build buildings, but it, it also has to do with uh, a number of other issues as well. <laughs> so. We may have uh, stretched the boundaries of our uh, technical ability here a little bit. Um, so, I, I mean the uh, the technical abilities that Peter and I brought to this. Not uh, we have lots lots of helpers here. Um, so, for some reason these aren't. Okay, the, the first project that I want to look at in a little bit more detail is a project that uh, we spent a number of years working on in Texas, and it's called uh, Prairie Ladder. It has a number of different parts, and it, uh, it's basically an examination or a kind of a, a study of the American prairie. And we had a, a project at the, the Connemara Conservancy just north of Dallas. And we made a proposal for five different structures, and, and we, we built some of them. But they're basically a, a very uh, kind of simple and direct way of uh, trying to experience the, the landscape of the American prairie in a, uh, a kind of a visceral way. So the, uh, we built a, a series of, of models and, and drawings that dealt with the way that uh, people would actually inhabit a place that is so kind of expansive and, and open and how, how you actually make it a, a place that can be occupied. So the, there were a series of different uh, structures that we explored in, in different ways and made uh, we had a number of exhibitions and uh, models and drawings. And then we started to build some of these. And again, our, our process of working with uh, any project is to, to try as quickly as possible to actually start cutting into the earth and actually to start building something. So we always enjoy working with the machines and uh, the people involved in uh, doing this kind of construction work. <laughs> and uh, the, sorry. So a lot of these projects also grow out of ideas that we had, had even since we were 
uh, small, we've always worked together and some of the earliest things that we did were uh, we would dig airplanes in the backyard. So we would dig a big uh, cross-shaped hole in the ground and then sit in there and make motor noises. <laughs> and so then later on we, we've actually done a number of projects similar to this, but we, we d dug a big hole in the ground uh, in a way where you could get down there and then at eye level experience the uh, the, the prairie and the smell and the, the feel of the earth and all of those things that, that we remembered and that probably everybody remembers about the earth. And then we also were very interested in the, this kind of broad expanse of the prairie and there's basically just two things that you can do. You either dig down into it and occupy the earth or you uh, figure out how you can climb up into the sky and occupy the sky, the, the two great elements of the prairie. So we built a, uh, a sky barge, and that's a uh, that's also a miss Q. So that that one can slide back. Um, the so th this project was a, uh, a a way to get up into the the air and then to 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 climb above the prairie and to focus on the, uh, the horizon, which is kind of the, the essential experience of, of the American prairie. You, you kind of imagine the occupation of, of space as, as this, this kind of uh, horizon line, and you imagine occupying vehicles that might, uh, like, like a barge floating in the sky, that might travel towards that horizon. Then. Uh, in a very different landscape, but a, in a very different type of project, many of the same issues are, are dealt with. This is a house on Puget Sound in, uh, near Seattle. And again, it's an exploration of a very specific landscape. And you can see in the, uh, in the site planning that there's actually a very simple uh, house structure that is set into a fairly complex site. So it becomes a... Uh, somewhat faceted and uh, apparently complex oops, apparently complex structure that is actually uh, from a, a kind of construction point of view it's a very regular uh, construction uh, structure and, and process but because it's set into the complexity of uh, real uh, a real landscape where you have very specific trees to wind around and very specific uh, winds that you, you deal with and specific light that you want to draw in, very specific views, this uh, basically rational structure becomes twisted and, and pulled and wrapped around the, uh, the, the landscape in very specific ways. And, and that, that, that's something that's uh, quite typical in all of our, our work. And also, Related to that, uh, we, we're also working on the, this kind of occupation of space from the point of view of uh, a kind of density of, of material that we uh, insert ourselves into as we build things. These things only work about... So the house is set into a, a circle of existing trees and it, it wraps around them and it, it attempts to become very much a, a part of that, that place both uh, physically and, and spiritually. The, uh, so basically we didn't in this case cut any trees other than uh, there was a single tree that was fairly special and that became a very uh, important part of the, the building. And then uh, we usually explore these projects in a, very, in a variety of different model forms and uh, uh, drawing forms and try to discover some kind of essential aspects that, that uh, we can again wrap the, the house around. In, in this case there's a kind of central core and some central uh, uh, family heirlooms that became uh, very important elements that uh, generated the, the direct form of the house. And again there's this kind of 
forking and twisting towards different opportunities and uh, different views and light. So in, the, uh, in the, that project, it's very uh, representative probably of the way that we've worked for a long time as, as carpenters. We're very interested in wood and in, in the craft of building and in, in working with uh, some excellent craftspeople and really just kind of learning how to build things and enjoying the, uh, the, the making of things in very uh, direct, hands-on kinds of ways. And that, that kind of direct uh, way of working then has also begins to have very specific uh, and direct ways that we try to deal conceptually with, with the landscape. So th this is a, a current project uh, in the mountains near Seattle. And it's a very steep site. And it's uh, the, the beginning of a uh, kind of a change in our, in our work very much an extension of what we were doing, but uh, a more uh, kind of specific uh, working with some, some new ideas that uh, have to do with the occupation of, of a landscape. And in this case, there's a, this house is on this very steep mountainside, and there's a, a trail that goes from the valley up to the, uh, the top of a, uh, a mountain. And the house becomes a switchback on, on the trail. It occupies a switchback. And as, as you move through the house, you actually participate in this kind of uh, walking along the, the sheer cliff wall, uh, climbing, and then coming back around. So um, I can never tell if people are laughing at what I'm saying or what's up there. Uh, as we said, we're kind of playing with, uh, with the, the stuff you have, so we've got numerous things going on. Um, so th this house wraps around, and then there's a, a very simple kind of marking of this, uh, uh, this point on, on the hillside, this, uh, this turning point is a kind of X. And so there's a, a fairly simple roof that's cut out and floats over the, uh, this, this trail. And then the house beneath the, uh, the roof kind of clings to the mountainside and kind of droops along the, uh, the hill and fills the, the space between that, that hovering roof and the, uh, the falling uh, mountainside. So it, it kind of locks in with a, a very uh, a very strong uh, engineered wall that really holds the uh, uh, the, the hill back, and there's always scree falling down. So we made a, a chute that uh, people will be able to dump the, the, the rock into, and it'll roll out underneath the house rather than having to be uh, piled up there. So th the whole thing kind of clings to the, the wall of the, uh, the mountain. And it becomes this, this place that you, you kind of climb up into as a, a kind of a reenactment of this uh, climbing of the mountain. And uh, another project that's uh, under construction right now in Seattle, uh, also very related to some of these same ideas, is this uh, uh, we're very interested in working with this landscape and, and the earth and trying to actually uh, pull a building up out of it. So in, in this case, we have a kind of a valley, a slightly uh, dish-shaped uh, piece of property. And we're trying to uh, kind of pull this building up in, in a way that uh, the building itself sags into, the, uh, into this little depression in the land, the, the roof and droops into the, uh, uh, the landscape and, and follows the landscape. And then the house hovers underneath this, this large roof that's like a cloud overhead. So everything is, there's this very uh, heavy X-shaped roof 
uh, which kind of reminds us of the, the sky in, in Washington as well, where you have a, uh, a very heavy, um, heavy presence above you all the time. And then the, uh, the framing is also built in a way that becomes like a, uh, a kind of net around uh, your, your presence in the, uh, in the site. So there's a kind of building up of the, uh, of a, a kind of wood curtain wall that moves around the, the building. And again, in a lot of our projects, we have a, an interior space that starts, that has many elements that kind of float around uh, within the, uh, the overall open space. But in this case, we've had the, the building enclosure kind of torque with the, uh, the slope of the hill. And instead of having the, the interior floating free, a lot of the interior core uh, is fixed solid. And there's the, the feeling that the, the house itself is starting to uh, twist around to accommodate the, uh, the light and the, the views that can be brought into the, uh, the building. So it's right about at this stage now, and it's uh, eventually going to look something like this. Um, the, the key to this project is this roof that uh, kind of marks the spot and uh, has these kind of forking attentions to, to different, uh, different views and to getting the, the light in over the, the, the shoulder since the the view is actually to the north. We have this large uh, roof monitor uh, that faces to the south. And uh, pretty much from any point in the house, you see this whole uh, hovering roof form with the, uh, the hole in the, the center that picks up a, a large amount of light and directs it down into the, uh, the house. Now we can spread those out a little bit.
I guess this is the mic that's uh, best for this section. What um, the, the sound from the previous little interlude was from, um, we, we do work with different um, composers and choreographers and other people on a variety of projects. That was, um, we built an installation, which Mark will talk about in the next section, that uh, was played by a group of composers and, um, and dancers. So the, the sounds were something that we built that was uh, played as an instrument. The, uh, just uh, also the, the sound, when you first, just before we came on, the sound was a, um, a band that we worked with on another lecture performance that they composed some things just for the performance. We weren't able to bring them along today, so we promised them we'd play their tape. But the, the next uh, section we wanted to talk about is the um, framing section. Our, we really started out in this um, business as carpenters and working in, um, in construction on, on sites, making things. So our, our earliest focus was always very narrowly focused on the actual site, you know, beginning with not even the whole site, but maybe the particular portion of a house that we were working on, our earliest opportunities were remodeling. But as we got a chance to do more and more custom work um, and doing more and more expensive houses, we found um, a great interest of ours in working on the rationalization of some of the systems we were working with. And one of the opportunities for working with that has been in the um, process of, of working on experimenting with structural systems and framing systems, and uh, particularly having um, an interest in this and looking for an opportunity for that. It's very difficult in this country in particular to work on kind of rationalized construction systems because labor's quite cheap and uh, materials in general are, are quite cheap. And so our, um, we became very involved in, in designing for, um, for export, particularly for work in Japan, where the, um, the labor is very high. Materials are, a lot of materials are exported from Washington State to Japan. So there was a, um, a very large industry happening. We started realizing all our subcontractors were becoming unavailable to us because they were going to Japan making a lot more money than we were. So we started uh, getting involved in that aspect of the work. Uh, that was just at the time of the, the crash in the Japanese, um, the, the Japanese bubble economy, which was actually about the best thing for architecture in a lot of ways because they were building so many bad things, um, especially in residential construction, American residential con style residential construction. So we had a real opportunity to work on uh, really rationalizing things to the point of, of making low cost uh, American style framing. And that uh, became a very big focus that we continue to work with to a large degree now. This project was a um, was actually done in this country. It was designed primarily for the, the purpose of being able to be applied to multiple settings. And it's a real shift from our, our background of being very uh, oriented to finding all of the custom aspects of a site, as Mark talked about in the earthwork section. We, in this case, we did have a site, but the house had to be designed to be adaptable and applicable to different situations. So it was uh, designed to be built in, in panels, and we, we rented a warehouse and built it off-site in these panels that were all sized for um, shipping in containers. It was brought to the site. You can see the, in the diagram on the right the different panels that came together to make up the, the house. And um, it actually worked very well. The, the whole house was erected on the site in about six hours from these panels that were put together. So one, one day of a, a pretty good-sized crew and a crane putting it all together. And it was uh, something we did largely as a demonstration for how this could work for applying this for, for export projects. And. Um, this particular house w had to be built for a very low budget. It was one of the reasons we were able to work with uh, these materials. The total construction budget was $80,000 for the house, and it's uh, about 1,600 square feet. So we had to work with very simple materials, which worked very well for the applications we were experimenting with. And uh, 
see. So this is images of the house under construction on the day that uh, the crane came and we had riggers come in with a, a crane company to work with our crew of carpenters on um, assembling it, bolting things together. And uh, it's actually started a whole series of, of projects that we've been working on for um, these kind of rationalized construction systems. One of the, the things that we worked on here is having windows that are placed on the outside of the studs so that the, uh, mo in most of the cases, the uh, windows are, the studs run right through the walls to allow for the customization and uh, application to this building to different sites. So you could put up the walls and then place the windows on the outside of the, the studs. So the studs run right through the windows and only the, uh, the main doors get the, get the headers. All the parts of it are, it's built out of uh, lumber yard grade material to and better construction material. So all the, the floors, all of the finish work was um, done with materials that could be easily assembled and didn't have to be too custom ordered. It has to do with the realities of shipping materials overseas. If you're short one piece of uh, molding or something, you can't just run to a local lumber yard and get it. So we've been working on a system of detailing so that everything can be made out of pieces that uh, come out of very standard parts that are readily available as part of the general package. This is also part of a, a series of projects we've been working on where the, uh, the interior is very open, partly from all load-bearing exterior walls that leaves all the interior open, and um, these uh, barges, sleeping barges, that are part of the upper lofts. So we've done a few houses with, with those. This is the um, first panelized house we, that we did in Japan, then taking this, the, what we learned from this other project, and uh, we had a client in Japan who is a, an architect and building contractor, but wanted to work with us on having a demonstration house for these techniques. This is on the Japan seaside in a small uh, kind of mountain ocean town of Tsuruga. And, uh, we're able to have the whole thing prefabricated uh, in, uh, mostly it was prefabricated in Portland in this case, shipped over in panels and put together on site and uh, was able to be far more cost effective than the other options that were available at, the, uh, at that time for the client. So we also did a, a number of applications for other buildings, more commercial buildings. This was a Kobe, um, it was a temporary community center. It was designed for the relief effort after the Kobe earthquake. The state of Washington was um, promoting some ideas, looking for some ideas to send over as part of the relief effort, and uh, this was part of a design competition for that, that project. Very much designed to be built very quickly and rapidly, come out of containers and be rapidly de deployed in a, uh, another place. The, uh, the project that we just got back from Japan about a month ago and was recently completed, a smaller project that uses the uh, all prefabricated parts and some of the, the prefabricated um, curved glue lamb truss systems we've been working on. It's part of a, a whole series of projects here. This is a, another part of that where we developed a lot of uh, diagrams for explaining the system. We've done a lot of teaching in Japan of uh, Western style building construction, which is uh, part of the, the effort to find more affordable, more cost effective ways to do high quality housing in Japan. It's a, a real problem in Japan to get high quality housing at an affordable cost. There certainly are excellent craftspeople there and excellent architects there. But it's, uh, there's been a great interest in utilizing American construction technology and construction techniques in Japan to make higher quality more affordable. So we've had some very interesting opportunities to work there both on the design side and the construction side and um, teaching and, and kind of technology side of working with those kinds of projects. These are all Japan projects, largely prefabricated. This is a, uh, a multi-generation apartment building. It, uh, it's another great need in Japan is 
new kinds of housing that accommodate the, the traditional system of having grandparents live in the house and uh, with the, the children doesn't fit with all of the needs of, of new families. So this is an apartment building that has a ground floor of apartments that are uh, accessible to people of all ages and abilities, and then upper floors, townhouse units above for uh, people with young, young children, perhaps, and rooftop terraces. It's in a very dense area south of uh, Tokyo, so not much land area, and uh, had to be very affordably priced to get the um, tax um, benefits that the Japanese government extends to Japanese contractors for um, providing low-cost, high-quality housing. It's been a very interesting project and uh, working with those kind of highly rationalized systems. And I wanted to show just a few images of how some of that work comes back to influence our custom house projects where we perhaps have the size of site or size of budget to allow more customized approaches but still using um, quite modularized or prefabricated construction systems. So we've, we've done a lot of work of experimenting with um, we started working with engineered wood products when they were first really becoming available and did a number of demonstration projects and kind of experimental projects. This house was done using um, sandwich panel roof structure system and curved glue lambs. We had all these parts prefabricated and brought to the site. It was a very difficult hillside site and um, allowed us to work with these uh, materials to get some, some shapes and interior spaces that would have been very difficult with more conventional framing systems. So it was a, a larger house that had more, more budget, more opportunity to experiment with these things. A lot of what we learned here then went back into the more highly uh, simplified and rationalized affordable projects. It was a, a smaller house using, um, done in Washington State that uses these kind of modularized systems. Again, it was a uh, kind of a test project for for doing export work. By doing some things close to our office, we were, and with our own carpenters and, and crews right there, able to experiment with some of these systems and have them um, work out some of the, the complexities of prefabricating before, before sending things. There's also a, uh, this is a larger house in Odawara, an outer suburb of, of Tokyo. Quite a large house and an expensive house and uh, project it includes a, um, both a residential portion and a, a showroom for their collection of, of Ferraris and um, very unusual clients. The, uh, the husband is, runs a gun business and the wife sells uh, Gucci handbags. They actually have these two shops right together. You walk in to the shop and you go right for Gucci and left for uh, camouflage. But uh, they uh, worked with us over, actually we, this house is fairly close to being finished. It's about five years in, five years project, but working with American materials combined with um, Japanese, some Japanese carpenters, some American carpenters, and uh, working with really a combination of, of uh, the needs of the Japanese client and the American construction system and American style open spaces. So it's been a very interesting project for us and also very interesting for us to uh, work with the Japanese building codes on how to work in steel and wood construction together. It's very difficult. Things get classified in Japan very much on it's either wood construction or it's steel construction or concrete construction. And particularly in residential projects, even large ones, the, um, the idea of com combining steel and wood together is almost unheard of and very difficult to get approved. And uh, but this project, for the, the lightness of some portions and some of the spans, it was very necessary to combine these. And it was a very interesting project for us to work through all of the, uh, the techniques, working with local Japanese architects, contractors, engineers, to uh, kind of put these together and show how it, it really could be done, working with the Japanese building codes. The, this project is in Texas. It's uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, it's part of a series, every time we hear about a new building material, we always want to build something with it. So this project is a uh, encapsulated styrene in, um, in concrete block. It's a system called raster block. It's a German system. They've made a new plant in northern Mexico to serve the North American market. And we got involved with this company early on and got some 
um, assistance cost-wise with uh, providing these materials so that we could do this project. This is for a, uh, a sculptor and uh, his wife, who's also an artist in Fort Worth. It's in addition to the back of a, an existing house, really beautiful small um, bungalow house in, in Fort Worth that we didn't want to modify the existing house. So we put this concrete um, structural system, concrete log tower in the back kind of buried in the pecan trees so that it uh, disappeared. So from the street side, you really don't see this. It more than doubled the size of the house for their growing family, but allowed them to stay in a very modest residential community without uh, changing the character. It was very interesting as a combination of these precast um, structural uh, load-bearing concrete walls together with, we did a lot of precast or cast-in-place work, working with the uh, the client who is a, a sculptor, and we designed a lot of parts together with him. The house is still under construction, but uh, he works in concrete and steel, so the whole house is designed together with him largely as a, uh, a sculpture in itself, um, with him doing a lot of the, the custom cast-in-place concrete work. So it's been a very, uh, learned a lot about this, these systems, and it's been a very interesting project for us to uh, be able to experiment with, uh, with these materials. I think this is the final project in this series. This is currently under construction in um, Washington State on an island in the uh, San Juan area. It's called Marrowstone Island. And it's a, a house that had to occupy as much space as possible because of uh, changing building regulations. The uh, shoreline setbacks were in the process of being changed. And the clients had a site where if they didn't build soon their site would become unbuildable because of the, the building, um, the, the zoning code changes. They also didn't have very much money, so the house is designed to um, work on claiming a large amount of space. There's a 4,000 square foot deck, which is on the, the middle level there. It's covered by a, a translucent plastic roof, and then within that are pavilions that house the, the different portions of the house, which are, to begin with, fairly small and can be expanded within this envelope. So once the exterior envelope of the structure is built, it can, um, the house can be um, expanded within that according to the, the zoning rules. This has been a very interesting project to work with on structurally. We have been experimenting recently with um, canted columns to resist the shear loads. We have Similar earthquake requirements to California. I don't think they're as strict in Washington, but uh, there's been increasing need to resist the, the sideways shear loads in the, the engineering and building codes, but we wanted to avoid having shear walls because the, the whole building is very, very open, and we didn't want a lot of uh, cross bracing. So we've been working on this project and several other projects lately with splayed columns that take up the, the sideways shear loads. So this project becomes kind of a forest of these uh, prefabricated glue lamb columns. And uh, taken together, they, they absorb all of the, the shear loads as well as the vertical loads. Been a really good project working with the engineers. And there's a prefabricating company that has a, an amazing high-tech uh, uh, computer-driven milling machine for these huge glue lambs. And uh, so they're, they're working through that part of the manufacture of those pieces right now. This is a picture of the, the machine. It's all built as a three-dimensional model in the computer and then comes straight out um, through the software. It goes into these glue lamps. They cut and do all of the mortise and tenons, all of the uh, more, more technical parts of cutting these. And the, the big revelation to us is it allows us to do much more, very precisely, to do things that would have been unaffordable if they were done as uh, hand timber, timber framing um, techniques. So we're very excited about this, working with this company. We're doing now a second project with them in Japan uh, for, for applying these to an export project. And uh, part of the, the series of things where we're always experimenting, learning, for, learning from the techniques that are available, any kind of new construction technology applications that we hear about, we're very interested in, in trying them out and finding a client who will let us try them out and uh, working through those. 
just one, one final series in this. Through our, our teaching, we've had a lot of uh, interest in, in working with students on the process of bringing the connection between virtual reality and, and actual reality together, having the students work on 3D model, models of, of framing and, and projects, and then building them life size. We did a series of projects uh, inviting lecturers in. We had, uh, this was a project we did with Gaetano Pesce. It invited him to come work with the students, first from a long distance, sending his sketches. Students turned the project into three-dimensional computer models. He approved those as we developed them, and then the students built the project full size in the courtyard of the, the school. This is at the University of Hawaii, and the uh, project took on a life of its own, which Pesce just loved when he saw all of, all of this fit in very well with his aesthetic. And then last spring, we did a project with Toyo Ito in much the same way, recycled all the lumber from the, the previous project, and built this, uh, this project, which uh, Ito called a POW, which means uh, wrapper. And it's kind of the creation of a, a space within a space, an urban space. Ito's done a, a number of projects, uh, um, the Tokyo Nomad Woman projects and some other things that he's been working on. So we got him involved in working with the students on uh, developing this and, and building it. It's been a very, very kind of exciting project for us to take a lot of what we've learned on construction sites and bring it into the, the school setting. Kind of, for one thing, showing them that not everything has to be so complex or expensive or impossible to, to organize and, and put together and uh, building a, a series of projects related to, to those things. Um, but uh, Mark, take over here. There, a little quick interlude.
the final section that we're going to talk about is the, uh, the plumbing section. And as, as we said at the beginning, we're, we're interested in these, these phases of uh, the way that we're organizing the work, uh, not just in the, uh, the very literal sense, although that's, that's definitely uh, a very important part of it, the kind of physical, literal sense of the terms. But we're also interested in, in these things in a, in a slightly different way as well. So when we're thinking of plumbing, we're thinking about all of the, uh, the connections between everything else that uh, goes on in the uh, construction of things and in, in the world. It's like the uh, plumbing is the, the, the connective systems and the, uh, the connective tissue as well. So we've done a, uh, a number of, of projects now where we're trying to explore uh, issues of, of space and, um, again, human occupation of, of landscapes and, and places in, in ways that are not strictly physical or not physical in the, in the visual and uh, uh, kind of more straightforward senses, but where we're trying to actually uh, think about how our experience of the world it transcends just visual experience and kind of a, a cerebral experience into a very uh, direct, uh, kind of visceral uh, feeling through our bodies in terms of the way that we experience and define and understand space. So this is a, a project that we did in Anchorage, Alaska a couple of years ago. It's called uh, Hot Plate, Cold Plate, Mud Map, Snow Blind, Bladder Bladder. And it's a, uh, a series of, uh, first of all, uh, kind of an urban investigation of, of Anchorage, trying to understand the, uh, the, the kind of basic way that human beings occupy Alaska and occupy the city of Anchorage so that we could first uh, kind of understand that and then propose ways of um, building or, or planning the city that would not just be a kind of a diagrammatic approach to urban planning, but would be a very um, a kind of a whole body approach to planning the city. And in, in Alaska, probably more than most places, you're completely aware of the place by the, the kind of searing cold or the blinding light. So we were also, we we're always interested in mud. And this is a place uh, that's kind of ringed in mud. Mud is a big, big problem in Anchorage, and it's actually uh, one of the most exciting uh, things to, to work with there. So um, we, we were looking at this from both the scale of, of, of Alaska itself, the scale of, uh, of the city, and then the scale of the, the human body as the the, the real source for generating ideas back out into uh, a larger scale. So to, to examine uh, our, our thoughts about the city, we built a machine. We didn't want to make drawings and we didn't want to uh, just write about it. We wanted to have a very, you know, since we were trying to understand the world through our bodies rather than through our minds or through our eyes, we wanted to find a way to present that information also in a very kind of direct and physical way. So we, we worked with, uh, we, we built some large bladders and uh, bladders are very important in, in Alaska, both in, in terms of transportation, uh, all kinds of things, gas and things are uh, kind of brought around in these huge bladders that we kept seeing everywhere and also the, uh, just these kind of big bladders of animals are, are quite fascinating there. So we built this machine that kind of reduced all of these kind of essential uh, physical attributes of, of the place that, that we, we kind of thought of as reducing Anchorage down to very basic forms. And, and those had to do with the mud itself, with the intensity of light at the horizon, uh, because you have the, the kind of white sky above and you have the, the white ground and then you have this intense sun that's always at, at the horizon. So you're almost always blinded and you're always then, uh, you're kind of denied your, your visual priority and you, you kind of experience the space through your, 
your awareness of the cold or the awareness of the sunshine or the heat. So th this is constructed in a, a black box theater and we set up a, a series of hot plates and cold plates. Everything is, uh, there's kind of two sides to the machine. One side is cold and the other is hot. They're visually identical, but you are kind of forced to understand the difference between these, uh, these objects by, uh, by experien experiencing the, uh, uh, experiencing them physically. So people would walk through the machine. Uh, there's a, a blinding light uh, against one wall that uh, puts everything into a, a kind of, uh, you're just kind of physically blinded by that. And then you, you rub up against these things, not even physically, but just being adjacent to them. So the, the system is actually fairly complex. It's a, a very literal, real plumbing project. Uh, there are uh, heaters and chillers and lots of hoses and copper pipe and uh, many layers of, of bladders. It's actually fairly hard to construct a, a kind of pumping uh, bladder and we, we, we worked with a number of engineers who after, uh, engineers and, and plumbers who initially uh, we thought would be kind of skeptical about this but uh, after about 15 or 30 seconds into the conversation everyone was taking the idea of uh, making pulsing bladders fairly seriously <laughs> and uh, we figured out how to make make these machines. So the uh, when you walk through it you have this, this sense with your body and we decided uh, that we didn't want to just, uh, we couldn't really document this, this dark thing so well. Uh, so we decided to, to film it in a, a different wavelength. We, we did infrared video and we discovered a, a lot of things about uh, space that were quite intriguing to us. Uh, human beings and objects don't just kind of e exist in a, uh, a kind of discrete, uh, discrete uh, presence within our, our defined physical wrapper, but we actually transmit our, our presence across space and our, our heat gets embedded in adjacent objects and uh, adjacent objects start to affect us. So we started to realize that space is really uh, full and it's, it's not about uh, a kind of placement of, a, an em of a, a discrete object into an empty space. Space is uh, just as, as physicists and chemists and people have known uh, much longer, um, space is about a very kind of complex uh, continuum of interrelationships. So uh, w once we saw our bodies embedded in, in our architecture and saw the architecture affecting uh, us back, we started to do a whole series of projects uh, trying to understand really the, the plumbing of, of space, I guess, where we were trying to no longer just design the building, but trying to design the medium that the building or the, the human body exists in, which is really what architecture is about, I guess, but um, space is always uh, very complex, at least to us, we, we kind of start to understand new inklings about what, what that means when architects talk about space. That always used to be mysterious to me, but I'm starting to learn things about it. Um, so th this is a project that we did with Andrew Zago uh, a couple of years ago. It's the uh, competition for the extension of the, the Prado Museum. And the, the whole project was dealing with trying to invent the, the medium of uh, the expansion, the, the air, the space, and uh, we weren't really dealing with the building itself. So the, the, uh, the way that we started to think about this was like uh, a vegetable. Uh, the, the significance of the vegetable is this kind of pulpy, vegetal uh, material that the, the seeds and the other important stuff exist within. So we were trying to invent this uh, and a vegetable pulp that we could uh, start to, to build within. And uh, I think we're, we're still not um, clear on how we can do this in a directly physical way yet. We have some other proposals coming up, but uh, we were uh, very 
interested in just the, the sense that one has, again, with your body. It's, uh, it's certainly with your mind, but your, your body as well knows when you're in a kind of dense historical place, uh, which is quite fascinating. And I don't know why that is exactly, but we, we were trying to see how we could kind of pull history and uh, all of that kind of density of uh, human culture that is so thrilling into uh, an awareness that we could actually start to design something with. So we were building a, a whole series of models and weaving things together, trying to, to find ways to, to represent uh, space. We, we always try to avoid representing. It's not something I like to do. We, we like to, uh, to actually make something rather than, than to represent it. But uh, this, this kind of weaving of these, uh, all of this, uh, material into a, a physical mass is what we were attempting to do. And at the same time, we're always trying to think, well, we can look at this rather abstractly, but how can we look at this in a very uh, direct way as well? So we had all of these different uh, thoughts about how do you fill a, a space? How do you uh, design the people within it? How do you uh, maybe set off a, a small bomb in a, a plaza, not, not a violent one, uh, but uh, uh, and, and then have a whole chain of events that occur within the, the kind of thickness of uh, human experience that's really much more important than the building itself. So there, there's some kind of humorous machines and uh, ideas that we had about uh, what, what are these kind of very material uh, presences in space that you can design with, things like smell and exhaust and uh, the motion of motor scooters surrounding buses and the kind of differential time and, and flow of all of these different things so that we could actually start to, to design experience and space with rather than just uh, defining a, a kind of physical envelope. And I, I think we're all very aware of, of that experience. Um, so often you'll go into a, especially a commercial space, a retail space, and especially in uh, some places, uh, I think this is in uh, Taiwan or possibly Vietnam, but anyway, uh, the, the kind of wonderful thing about entering the space is that there's no building there, there's no, uh, no presence of anything except uh, the, the kind of commerce itself. It's, it's a non-building, it's a dense space of, of commerce. And so that, that kind of interest in making um, space that isn't, uh, where the building is the most minimal armature and then the, the kind of human life that ad adheres to it becomes the actual definition of experience in space is something that we've looked at in several projects. This was a uh, competition project for the, uh, the Kansai National Science uh, Library in, in Japan. And here we were working with uh, the idea of registering all of the ambient information that washes across the site. So there's always the, um, the kind of satellite uh, messages and radio waves, television, all of these things that could kind of create electric fields and cause um, clouds to, uh, to, to register on electrical uh, glass panels, uh, panels that would register uh, electrical signals. So there's a, a series of panels that, uh, glass panels with the, the library stacks in between. And it, this is a, a very, the, the idea was to have a very, very simple glass armature that would essentially disappear until the, uh, um, until something sweeps across it, both the, uh, the kind of ambient uh, information that uh, is always around us uh, that makes up this kind of density of experience and density of space, uh, but also the, uh, we're working with ideas of trying to register the, the data that people are working with inside this, uh, this library, uh, because as, as we become so much less material in, a, in the things that we work with, uh, those of us who are really interested in, in touching things and making things and, and working with real material, I think are, are going to have to try very hard to, to grab a hold of the immaterial and make it very physical and wrap it around us in uh, some, some new way. So we're trying to imagine 
occupying this library in a way that you would just be washed uh, across continually with both the, uh, the, the recorded data and then the sunshine flowing through the data would register shadows and it would become again this kind of pulpy vegetable mass of information but it's very physically registered and becomes a very uh, direct and physical experience in our lives. This is a, uh, a project that again works with, uh, is a great opportunity to work with a, um, a, a new medium that people could occupy, an, a new landscape that's uh, the, the treetops. And uh, the, this is a project at the Evergreen State College in Olympia. And uh, Karen Toludo worked with us on, on this project when she was a student uh, there. She's now a student here. Um, this is a, uh, a classroom and uh, research uh, kind of laboratory facility that would be a part of the, um, the, the, the university, the, the Evergreen State College. It would attach to their library and become a kind of a, we thought of it as very much a kind of scientific instrument, a, uh, a scientific apparatus that would go out into the, the tree canopy and bring information and ideas back. So we built a, um, or we proposed this construction of a, uh, a series of walkways that bring people out into this new spatial medium uh, and a series of research platforms and a classroom. And the thing that fascinated about us about this is that here we had this vegetable pulpy mass that we'd been trying to, to figure out how to build and it exists hovering over us all the time in, in dense forest canopies. And we were working with the scientist, uh, Nalini Nadkarni, who's a, a specialist in these, these treetops and she kind of introduced us to this amazing, dense uh, world that populates, uh, animal world and uh, plant world that populates this, this pulpy vegetal medium of, of the, the forest. So we, we imagined uh, taking uh, our hand out and we, we proposed attaching this to the library because we wanted this to be a, a kind of a center of knowledge that would, uh, of, of kind of physical scientific knowledge that would get pulled into the, uh, the library. And so we, we built models of this that uh, are, are really very simple uh, kind of scientific uh, lab bench type uh, apparatuses. And uh, they have, it's immediately adjacent to the, uh, the steam plant for the university. So we, we can create these kind of mini, uh, many environments for scientific research, but also the idea of this project was to make it more than just a, a scientific uh, experience and to open it up to many other uses and uh, collaborative projects from other fields and other, other disciplines. So uh, the, the project has a number of kind of playful things. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, uh, kind of machine-like, scientific apparatus, but at the same time it has a, uh, we, we proposed having this a bladder on the top of the classroom that would be filled with hot steam and water and there would be moss that would grow on it and you could sit up there on this giant water bed of a kind of pulsing uh, moss and watch films up in the treetop. So we had a, a number of different uh, kind of ideas about how we could occupy this space in a very uh, kind of physical um, way that you, you would just kind of uh, really kind of soar out into the treetops and uh, uh, occupy it uh, very physically. Okay, uh, Peter mentioned then the uh, the, the music in the, in the last uh, little interlude was, or or in the interlude before the. The one right before this, that, that was a mud sound from the Alaska project. It was actually people uh, walking through uh, wet mud. Uh, but this project, we worked with a choreographer, uh, Crispin Spaeth, and with a, uh, 
uh, sound composer, Suzy Kazawa, to uh, actually play this, this space after we built it. But the, uh, the space is an attempt to, to build upon the ideas from the, the Alaska project and we were building a, an occupiable bladder that would actually record uh, people's occupation of it and reproject that back as a, uh, as a projected uh, visual medium that people could pass through. So we went through a number of different studies and then created this, this kind of machine, which again is a, a kind of major plumbing project. It has plumbed mud, hot and cold, flowing liquids, and a lot of pipes and uh, uh, pulsing bladders, a number of different uh, things. It's all built out of uh, cast in place uh, polyurethane rubber that we, we built on the floor and then uh, pulled up into place. And then when people would move through the object, they would be recorded in uh, video and in infrared video, and that would be reprojected back onto this uh, kind of transparent skin so that uh, we were trying to create this experience that we could read in the, uh, in the film and see if we could actually recreate this physically and, and make that a, a real experience that one could occupy. This is another project that we're working on right now with Andrew Zago in Detroit, and it's uh, quite an opposite thing where the, the city itself, uh, as you can kind of see from these slides, the city is um, becoming smaller and uh, space is expanding. It's kind of the opposite of the, the typical, uh, what we think of traditionally as a typical urban problem. Um, space is increasing, emptiness is increasing, density is disappearing. So we were interested in, in taking some of these materials that are disappearing and trying to make a very dense uh, project out of it. Um, so the, we, we have done a number of studies and models and the, the basic proposal is to build up in the, the kind of empty foundations that are uh, scattered through this kind of returning uh, prairie land and to fill it with uh, lifts of concrete with the embedded uh, detritus of some of the burned out buildings and uh, building a kind of extremely dense um, object that people could uh, kind of gather around as a uh, as just a, a kind of denseness that is uh, maybe lacking or that uh, people can experience the, the kind of burgeoning emptiness and they would want to be instead around a, uh, a real dense uh, presence of, of past material. Okay, then this is the, uh, the final project that I'd like to talk about, and there's a, uh, just a two-minute film uh, that we want to show of this. This is a, uh, a project that, that builds on these ideas. It's a proposal for a, uh, a train station in Seattle. We're, we're building a, a new light transit system, and this is a, a proposal to build a, a, a place for the, uh, uh, a, a transit station that would be, again, a kind of empty armature until the uh, train arrived and the, the people kind of blossom into the, the space. So it's a very simple glass armature with operating uh, flaps that are, are dampened with hydraulically. But it's, it's working with the idea that when, when a train comes into a station, it, uh, there, there's this kind of wall of, of air that is pushed in, so there's this, this kind of very um, dense uh, barometric pressure change that people are aware of with their bodies, and then when the train leaves, there's a kind of sucking out and a, a kind of absence of, uh, of matter, and so it's, it's a kind of very typical phenomena that we're all used to, but we want to we want to work with that to have the train come in, uh, the, the whole thing opens up when the people 
you know, because of that, that volume of air pushed in, uh, when the people spill out of the train, they're recorded uh, with um, infrared video and it's reprojected and the, the whole building kind of spills open. It's projected out this kind of colorful blossoming of, uh, of life scattered across the, the wet pavement of the streets and uh, it, it kind of works with the, 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 what we think of as not material things, but the, uh, these things that, that our bodies are, are very aware of, these kind of changes in heat, changes in pressures, changes in the presence and absence of people. So it's, uh, uh, again, trying to make this kind of vegetable medium for people to occupy. So there's a uh, short film that introduces this. And, and this, this project also was um, a, something that dealt with uh, a new way to make construction documents too, in a, in a way that was more um, kind of respectful of all of the different trades, really trying to embed in the documents the big idea of the project, the poetic intent. Seattle will build a new transit system, a 19th century passenger network tying together 19th century cities and 20th century suburbs. It will be built in the 21st century when practical necessity no longer requires the movement of bodies. Since we can now sit at home, we are told, and bring the world to us electronically. But we will still transport our bodies, not of necessity, and start for the pleasure of motion within the unfolding new world before us. Our bodies and our minds floating out centrally, linked within the new liquid space of the city experientially transformed. The trains and stations and buildings and tracks must accommodate the new role of the body as the magic and the force, the pulsing, transforming organism, floating out freely into the city, merging with the space of its experience, merging with the space of its members. The new train and its stations and riders will abandon their 19th century forms and become clouds of planets and lights in the space of Seattle. The project is not simply to build train stations as we know them. The project is to build slow pulsing clouds of humanity in motion. The train stations are the enabling armature for these constructive clouds of insistent human life passing through the veins of the city and filling forth as large breaths of physical presence pumped softly into the space. This document is being constructed in a particular way. We are writing space. This new interactive and multi-channel construction document will merge writing and thinking and reading with the space of things and the space of experience. We are inventing a new way to write construction documents and a new way to think about buildings so that we can read and write floating in space, traveling inward and outward within the cloud of the spot. As we refer to the city, forward and backward, by this route and that route, through the space of the idea, Outside of the line of the living thought, writing and reading and being and building, a float on the page in the space of the project. Who would clean all the glass and equipment and the stations and punctuate the station clouds with life and dance and safety of numbers? There would be three shifts per day, 200 glass scrubbers per crew, three crews to each station. Each scrubber would be clad in silver and mirrors reflecting light and scattering image, scrambling rhythmically across glass and aluminum catwalks. Swinging in bungee elastic 